from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of AWS reInvent 2020. Sponsored by Intel and AWS. Well, welcome back to the Cube's live coverage of AWS reInvent 2020. It's virtual this year, over three weeks. Next three weeks, we're here on the ground covering all the live action, hundreds of videos, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We're virtual, not in person this year. So we're bringing all the interviews remote. We have Deepak Singh, Vice President of Compute Services, a range of things within Amazon's world. He's the container guy. He knows all what's going on with open source. Deepak, great to see you again. Sorry, we can't be in person, but this is the best we could do. Thanks for coming on. Oh, and uh, big keynote me. news, All you're all over the keynote. Your DNA is everywhere in the keynote. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, no, uh, no, thanks for having me again. It's always great to be on the cube. Unfortunately, not sitting uh, in the middle of the floor at uh, reInvent, which I kind of miss. I know, but uh, it was a great morning for us. We had a number of announcements in the container space and sort of adjacent to that in the developer and operator experience space about making it easy for people to adopt things like containers and serverless. So we are pretty excited about Andy's keynote today and the rest of reInvent. It's interesting, you know, I've been following uh, Amazon now, it's our A3 invent. Um, I've been using Amazon since EC2 started, tell Matt Garman that story. But if you look at like, the mainstream market right now, this is a wake up call for cloud, um, mainly because the pandemic has been forced upon everybody. And I talked to Andy about that. He brought it up in the keynote, but you start to get into the meat on the bone here when you say, okay, what does it really mean? You the containers, the serverless, uh, the machine learning all kind of tie together. Obviously the computer is getting faster. So you see an absolute focus of infrastructure as a service, which has been the bread and butter for Amazon Web Services. But now that kind of, you know, connective tissue between where the machine learning kicks in. This is where I see containers and Lambda and serverless really kicking ass and, and really fill in the hole there because that's really been the innovation story and containers are all through that. And the EKS Anywhere was to me the big announcement because it shows Amazon's uh, vision of taking Amazon to the edge, to the data center. This is a big important announcement. Could you t explain EKS anywhere, because I think this is at the heart of where customers are looking to go to. It's where the puck is going. You're skating to where the puck is. Explain the importance of EKS anywhere. Yeah, I'll actually step back and I talk about a couple of things here. Uh, and I think some of the other announcements you heard today, like the smaller outposts, uh, uh, you know, uh, the one you and do you outpost skews are also part of that story. So, I mean, if you look at it, AWS started thinking about what will it take for us to be successful in customers' data centers a few years ago, because customers still have data centers, they're still running there. And our first uh, step towards that was, AWS in many ways benefits a lot from the way we build hardware, uh, how what we do with Nitro, all the various EC2 instance types that we have, what we have with EBS. And our post was, can we bring some of the core fundamental properties that AWS has into a customer data center which then allowed ECS and EKS and other AWS services to be uh, run on outposts because that's how we run today. But what we started hearing from customers was that was not enough for two reasons. One, not all of them have big data centers. They may want to run things on, you know, in a much smaller location. I like to think about things like oil rigs or point of sale places, or they may have existing hardware that they still plan to use and intend to use for a very long time. With the foundational building blocks, EC2, EBS, those get difficult when we go on to hardware that is not AWS hardware, because we very much depend on that. But with containers, we know it's possible. So we started thinking about what will it take for us to bring the best of AWS to help customers run containers in their own data center. So I'll start with Kubernetes. So with Kubernetes, people very often pick Kubernetes because they start containerizing inside their own data centers. Mm -hmm. And the best solution for them is Kubernetes. So they learn it very well, they understand it, their organizations are built around it, but then they come to AWS and run any chaos. And while Kubernetes is Kubernetes, if you're running upstream, something that runs on-prem will run on AWS, they end up in two places, in sort of two situations. One, they want to work with AWS. They want to get our support, they want to get our expertise. Second, most of them, once they start running EKS, realize that we have a really nice operational posture with EKS. It's very reliable, it scales. They want to bring that same operational posture on-prem. So with EKS Anywhere, what we decided to do was start with the bits underlying EKS, the EKS distro that we announced today. It's an open source Kubernetes distribution with some additional pieces that, uh, that we add, 
some of the add-ons that we use that can be run anywhere. They're not dependent on AWS. You don't even have to be connected to AWS to use EKS distro. Uh, but we will patch it, we will update it. It's an open source project on GitHub. So that's the starting point. That's available today. Then over the next several months, what we'll add is all the operational tooling that we have for EKS, we will make available on premises so that people can operate their Kubernetes clusters on prem just the way they do on AWS. And then we also announced the EKS dashboard today, which gives you visibility into all your Kubernetes clusters on AWS. And we'll extend that so that any Kubernetes clusters you're running will end up on that dashboard. So you get a single view into what's going on. And that's the vision for EKS anywhere, which is if you are running Kubernetes, we have an operational approach to running it. We have a set of tools that, we're going to, that we have built. We want everybody to have access to the same tools. And then moving from wherever you are to AWS becomes super easy because you're using the same tooling. Uh, we did something similar with ECS as well, with ECS Anywhere, but we did it a little bit differently, where in ECS you have a centralized control plane, and all we want to, for you is to bring a CPU and memory. Uh, the demo for that actually runs on a bunch of Raspberry Pis. So as long as you can install the ECS agent and connect to an AWS region, you're good to go. So same problem, different, slightly different solutions, uh, but then we, our customers fall into both buckets. So that's that's the general idea is yeah. when we say anywhere, it means anywhere and we'll meet yeah. you there. And then data centers running EKS in the data center and cloud, all good stuff. The yeah. other thing that came out I want you to explain is the importance of what Andy was getting to around this notion of the monolith versus microservices, yeah. that one slide he put up. And that's where he was talking about Lambda and containers yeah. for smaller compute loads. What does it mean? What was he talking about there? Explain yeah. what he means by that. That's, uh, it's kind of subtle and quite honestly, it's not uh, unique to Lambda and containers. That's the way the world was going, except that with containers and with serverless functions with Lambda, you've got these new small building blocks that allow you to do it that much better. So, you know, you can break your application up into smaller and smaller pieces. You can have teams that own each of those individual pieces. Each of those pieces, each of these services can be built using the architecture that you see fit. Some of them make sense, purely serverless, Lambda and API gateway. Other things you may want to run on ECS and Fargate. A third component you may have, be depending on an open source ecosystem of applications, and there you may want to run on Kubernetes. So what you're doing is taking up what used to be one giant app, breaking up into a number of constituent pieces, each of which is built somewhat independently, or at least can be. Mm -hmm. The problem now is how do you build the infrastructure where the platform teams have visibility into what are all the services, are they being run properly? And also, how do you scale this within an organization? You can't train an entire org on Kubernetes overnight. It takes time, Similar with, similarly with serverless. Um, so that's kind of what Andy was talking about. That's where the world is going. And then to address that specific problem, we announced uh, AWS Proton. Uh, AWS Proton is essentially a service that allows you to bring all of these best practices together, allows a centralized team, for example, to decide what are the architectures they want to support? What are the tools that they want to support? Infrastructure as code, continuous delivery, observability, you know, all the buzzwords, but that's where the world is going. And then gives them a single framework where they can deploy these and then the developers can come into self-service. So it's like, I want to build a service using Lambda. I don't need to learn how to put it all together. I'm just going to put my code and point it at this stack that my centralized team has built for me. All I need to do is put a couple of parameters in and I'm off to the races and now scale it to N and it gives you the ability to manage all of that. So it's really kind of the building yeah. blocks, pushing that out to the customer. I got to ask you real quick on the Proton, that's a fully managed service Correct. by AWS. Can you explain what that means for the developer customer? Yeah. What's the bottom line? What's the benefit to them? So the biggest benefit to developers is they don't need to become an expert at every single technology out there. They can focus on writing application code, not have to learn how to crawl infrastructure and how pipelines are built and what are the best practices. They could choose to do so. The developers, you know, modern companies, sometimes developers wear two hats. They're the builders of the sort of underlying scaffolding and, the, and they build the applications. For an application developer now, all you have to do is in writing an application code and then just go into Proton and say, this is the architecture that I'm going to choose. You self-service it and then you're off to the races. If there's any underlying component that's changing or any updates are coming on, Proton will automatically take care of those updates for you or give you a signal that says, hey, the stack has to be updated, so it's time to redeploy a code. So you can do all of that in a very automated fashion. Uh, that's why everything is done as infrastructure as code. It's like a key uh, infrastructure and code as, and continuous delivery are sort of key foundational principles 
of yeah. Proton. And what they basically do is do something that every company that we talk to wants to do, but only a handful have the teams and the skill set to do that. It takes a lot of work yeah. and it takes a lot of retraining. And now most companies don't need to do that, or at least not at that scale. So I think this is where the automation and the manageability that Proton brings makes life a lot easier. Yeah, and a lot of developers know Docker containers. They're very familiar with it. They want to use that, whatever workflow. Uh, yeah. Quickly uh, explain again to me so I can understand fully the benefit of the, the Lambda container dynamic because what, what was the use case there? What's the problem that yeah. you solved and what does it mean for the developer? What specifically yeah. is going on there? What's the, what's the benefit? Why do I care? Yeah, uh, so I'll actually talk about one of the services that uh, my team runs uh, called uh, AWS Batch. AWS Batch has a front end that's completely serverless. It's Lambda and API gateway. It's back end is ECS running on EC2. Right? That's the where the back end services run uh, and where a customer's uh, jobs end up running. Uh, our customers are just like that. Um, you know, we have many customers out there that are building services that are either completely serverless or they fit that pattern. They are triggered by events. They're taking an event from something and then triggering a bunch of services or they're triggering an action which is doing some data processing. And then they have these long running services, which almost universally now are running on containers. How do you bring all of this together into a single framework as opposed to some people being experts on Lambda and some people being experts on containers? That's not how the real world works. So trying to put all of this because these teams do work together into a single framework was our goal because that's what we see our customers doing. And I think they'll, they'll do it more. Uh, related to that is the fact that Lambda now supports uh, Docker images or container images as a packaging format because a lot of companies have invested in tooling to build container images and now Lambda can benefit from that as well while customers get all the you know, magic that Lambda brings you. Yeah, a couple of years ago on the, on the Cube, I, I shared this tweet out earlier um, in the week, Andy, uh, we pressed Andy when serverless was launched, it's like, would you launch, uh, build Amazon on Lambda? He says, we probably would. And then he announced to me, and he also, I think he mentioned in the keynote that half of Amazon's new apps are built on Lambda. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, this is a new generation of developers. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you, look, if you talk about Lambda today also, but even like even on the container side, almost half of the con new container customers that we have on AWS in 2020 have chosen Fargate, which is serverless containers. So they're not picking ECS or EKS and running it on EC2 they're running it on Fargate, the vast majority of those three CS, but we see that trend on the container side as well. And actually it's accelerating more and more and more new customers will pick Fargate than running containers on EC2. Deepak, great to chat with you. I know you got to go. Thanks for coming on our program, breaking down the keynote analysis. Yeah. You got a great um, focus area. It's only going to get hotter and uh, <laughs> grow faster and a lot more controversy and goodness coming at the same time. So congratulations. Thank you. And always great to be here. Thanks for coming on. This is theCUBE Virtual. We are theCUBE Virtual. I'm John Furrier, your host. Thanks for watching.